All right, it's 8 p.m. here in Brussels, uh, 2 p.m. I think in New York. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, hi to all the members. Very happy to see you all. Hello, Kevin. Uh, great to see you. Thank you for making time. Um, so, as announced today, we are going to have an event with Kevin Webster. Uh, Kevin Webster holds a master's degree from Ecole Polytechnique in France. Uh, and a PhD from Princeton University. After that, he worked uh, at several firms. He worked at Citadel, Deutsche Bank, and BNP Paribas. And uh, Kevin is also now teaching at Columbia, uh, at Imperial, and also at Fordham. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you, Kevin. Uh, the Beta Sigma Club this time crossed the Atlantic, uh, which is very nice. Uh, and with no further ado, I will hand over to you, Kevin. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me. And thank you again for, for organizing these events. I, I very much enjoyed, um, for example, the one that you had with Jean-Philippe uh, Bouchot a couple of months ago. Uh, so my name is Kevin Webster, as, as Rita mentioned, and um, I'll be talking about price impact models and stochastic control and finance. Um, so I'll start with a quick definition of both, just to, to have uh, a setting to speak of. And then I'll give an example of an application of both. And then I'll have some concluding thoughts on um, uh, why we use these things and how, how, how we move forward with uh, price impacts, gas control, uh, and applications to mostly trading. Um, so first, what is price impact? Um, the best way to define price impact is in, uh, by distinguishing it from alpha signals. Um, so for example, as a context, we can look at a quant portfolio manager or a execution team at a bank. Um, so in the case of a quant portfolio manager, you use return predictions to decide how much to trade, how much to invest in different assets. And there's that uh, there's a trade-off between expected future returns and transaction costs. This is the um, alpha versus TC trade-off. And um, in that trade-off, uh, you end up with two types of price predictors, two types of return predictions, alpha signals and price impact. Both of them will predict returns, meaning both an alpha signal and price impact signal might predict something like this stock is going to go up by 5%. However, um, they are dis distinct. Um, so mathematically, the, the way they are distinct is uh, because of the cause and effect relationship. So in the case of an alpha signal, you're predicting a return that would happen regardless of the portfolio's trades, meaning regardless of whether this portfolio manager or broker submits the trade or not, you expect the price of the stock to go up by 5%. Because of this independence assumption, alpha signals correspond to trading opportunities, meaning if I choose not to trade, uh, then I just lose out on this 5% return. So this would be a profit if I chose to trade on this. Price impact is the exact opposite. Um, these are returns explicitly caused by your trades, meaning if you don't trade, then that 5% return won't happen. And what that means is that it's not a trading opportunity anymore. If I don't trade, I don't get the opportunity cost of not capturing the 5% because the 5% doesn't happen. And actually what you end up showing um, is that not only are these not trading opportunities, these end up being trading costs because after you push up the price, you make the costs of your future trades more expensive and then all these price, all these returns tend to revert back. Um, so I've distinguished between two types of predictions, but to really um, hammer in the idea that not only are they distinct, but they, they need to be distinct from a, from a trading perspective. And they lead to diametrically opposed actions. So this is not just a semantics uh, kind of distinction. This is a concrete, practical, and important uh, distinction. So I'll quote my um, old boss, Daniel Naren, who is now a uh, senior manager at ADIA, the Abu Dhabi Investment Authorities. So in his book, um, he, he really pretty concisely uh, captures why it's so important to distinguish between alpha and price impact. So I'll, I'll just quote verbatim for now. If we find that most of the cost is due to price drift, alpha, the best option would be to accelerate the trading and pay more impact to capture more attractive prices. Conversely, if the cost is mostly driven by impact, then it would behoove us to slow down our trading to minimize the impact. This is related to what I said about 
uh, alpha being trading opportunities and impact being uh, trading costs. Um, if I think the price is going to move up independently of what I trade, then I want to trade as fast as possible. I want to get, get ahead of that alpha. Um, if I think I'm causing the price, the return, then me accelerating is only going to make things worse. If I start trading faster, market makers will update their prices even faster, and all I'm doing is pushing up prices further for my next trades. Um, so again, this is um, the, the goal of this quote is to showcase that not only do we distinguish between alpha and price and back from a, I guess, uh, from a causal perspective, but it also leads to different actions from trading algorithms and specifically diametrically opposed actions. Um, maybe to give another example of this causal nature of price impact, uh, I'll give a, a slightly different application, this time from, uh, I'll quote the Mann Institute. So um, Powery, Zhang, and Zorin are three authors who work at the, well, at the Mann Institute. Um, and in one of their papers where they train a reinforcement learning agent to do optimal execution, they mentioned that they train their reinforcement learning agent in a simulated market. And part of that market simulation is being able to model price impact. Why? Because, I'll give the quote, the powerful aspect of having a market simulator is that it effectively enables the rerunning of different realities where interventions with the markets either do or do not occur. Again, this goes back to causal models. Um, if you use an alpha signal, no matter what you trade, you'll always get the same price path. But with a price impact model, you will get different price paths. So here I'll give um, a very simple simulation. I start off with a baseline trading strategy, and then I simulate a faster strategy and a slower strategy. And because I'm using a price impact model, again, similar to this uh, uh, paper by the Mann Institute, a market simulator, uh, I end up with different price paths depending on which strategy I use. Again, because price impact um, captures the, the, the feedback loop from the market rather than just a exogenous prediction. So that's price impact. Let me take that aside for uh, a couple of minutes. I'll talk about stochastic control, and then again, we'll, we'll go into an example and, and the intersection of the two. Um, uh, so, so this might be very, very uh, well-known uh, uh, well-trodden grounds by, by especially members of the club, but I just want to make sure that we're all on, on the same footing, that we all use the same vocabulary. So from my perspective, I view stochastic control as an extension of stochastic echoes. It's the intersection of optimization and stochastic uh, analysis. I come from, from, the, uh, from a French background, and so we study a lot of stochastic calculus, and therefore stochastic control for me is just you, you put on some optimization on top of some, some ETO uh, calculus. But if you come more from an optimization background, think of it as optimization with some stochastic process inside. And both of these are non-trivial extensions because in stochastic calculus, suddenly uh, talking about things that you control and things that you don't control leads to all kinds of very technical and very interesting problems about, uh, say, if you do game theory, open loop, closed loop, endogenous, exogenous. And similarly, on the optimization side, when you do deterministic optimization, there's lots of complexity there already. But um, you, again, don't have this notion of endogenous versus exogenous. What, once you've optimized, it, just everything is deterministic anyway. Uh, so, so that distinction is, is very, very important. So let me go into slightly more, more formal um, rather than this hand wavy high level um, statement. So when I, when I look at control problem, I start off with a filtered probability space. So my space of outcomes, my space, my set of uh, measurable events, my filtration, that's just how my information set evolves over time, and my probability measure on all of this. And that's that's standard in, in stochastic analysis. And what happens when I add stochastic control to it is I become very, very precise, uh, slightly obsessively precise about what I control and what I don't control. And I'll make that point many times in this talk, and I uh, apologize for the amount I'm going to repeat myself, but um, it is extremely important to distinguish uh, the actions that you are able to do. So typically we want to eventually plug this into a trading algorithm or a live production system, being extremely explicit about what are the actions that this algorithm can take is important. Then a second uh, type of variable that we want to keep track of are state variables. State variables are variables that are affected by our control, but that we don't explicitly or directly control. 
So we, are at, we have actions, which we call controls, that we directly, we can set them to a value that, are, that is a decision we make. We have state variables, which are variables that are affected by our control. So a typical control variable would be, for example, at what speed I trade or what, on which venue I trade. A state variable would be something like my PNL. I don't get to choose my PNL. My PNL is definitely not, you know, I can't just set it to be uh, $100,000, uh, but it's definitely affected by my control. And finally, I give myself an objective function. So I can maximize usually my expected wealth or some utility function of my wealth. So here I wrote in very general terms, a running cost and a terminal cost. Um, optionally, I can add constraints. So for example, if X here is my position, then I could constrain my position to be long only, to always be positive. And these are basically the ingredients of a uh, of stochastic control theory. Let me give an extremely vanilla standard example, probably one of the first ones in finance, which is Merton's portfolio optimization problem. So in Merton's portfolio optimization problem, and this is partly the, the, the discovery of, I guess, Merton and Markowitz is phrasing things as control problems over stochastic processes and using eto calculus um, to solve them. Your control variable is your allocation. You pick how much you allocate on stocks, bonds, or individual um, stocks. Your state variable is your PL, your wealth. You don't directly control it, there are random shocks to it, but clearly if you invest in more um, risky stocks, you'll have higher expected returns, but also a higher risk profile. And then you give yourself a utility function and you maximize uh, your wealth. And you pick the allocation that maximizes your uh, expected utility. Um, again, I assume that most people have seen this. I'm going to give now the example that's a little bit closer to what I'm going to talk about, which is Galliano and Pedersen's statistical arbitrage problem. And I'll talk about the risk neutral case. Um, the original paper also solves the case with risk aversion. Um, but again, I, I want to keep things really easily simple. Um, so in the statistical arbitrage problem, um, you what the trader or the trading algorithm controls is their trading speed. So Q is going to be my, my position, Q prime is going to be my trading speed. My state variable is going to be the impact I have on the market. So that's going to depend on my trading speed. If I choose not to trade, I have no impact on the market. If I cho choose to trade a lot, I will have a lot of impact. So typically you write it with an SD of some sort. This is a very simple exponential moving average style SD. So yeah, and hopefully it's obvious from the SD slash OD in this case. But um, if you set Q prime equals zero, um, this is just an exponential decay. Um, so yeah, impulse control, exponential uh, decay. And what you want to maximize is your expected wealth. So in this framework, the way you, you, you can write it in multiple ways, but they all end up boiling down to this type of equation here. For each uh, over, uh, um, over an infinitesimal uh, time interval dt, I'm going to trade q prime times dt. That's a trade over a certain interval of time. And that trade is going to capture in expectation my alpha signal. So if I think the price is going to go up by 5% by end of day, I think I'm going to capture 5% of return. This is in the absence of transaction cost, and I pay the impact. So I just get that my expected wealth is alpha minus impact times trade. And I just accumulate all the trades, and that's my my uh, statistical arbitrage problem. Um, if you want to do optimal execution instead, you put a terminal constraint so that you, for example, do a round trip trade or do a trade that sets your position to zero. Um, this happens to have a close and formula. We'll go quickly through a proof later down the slides. Um, but the the point here is that uh, the goal of stochastic control is ultimately either numerically or ideally in closed form, get a formula for the optimal action so that you can implement the optimal action in a live trading algorithm. So in this case, it's a very nice, simple format. My trading speed is a constant times my alpha minus some um, adjustment for, um, for the convexity or concavity of the alpha, which is going to be related as we'll see later to the decay of the alpha. Basically, if my alpha is very front loaded, meaning it will realize very quickly, I want to trade faster. If my alpha is very backloaded, meaning nothing's happening now, I have a lot of time until it actually realizes, then I'm going to trade slower. I have more time to do so. Um, and you know, intuition is important, and I'll, I'll mention trade intuition quite a fair bit. Uh, but at the end of the day, this is the intuition doesn't matter to the trading algorithm. It only matters so that you can communicate to stakeholders that this is a reasonable algorithm to do. But at the end of the day, the algorithm is just going to implement the formula and 
given these uh, parameters, so your, your liquidity parameters and your alpha signal, it's going to implement this trade. Um, yeah, um, there is a lot of, of literature on the topic. Um, I'm picking a particular thread that I like because it, it reads very linearly, but the, obviously this is a tree with a lot of other branches, and uh, this is a, uh, I really recommend reading through as much of the literature as possible, and also obviously my book, but also the, the, the very good books by uh, Cartea, Jean Gall, uh, Olivier Guéant. There's lots of very good material here. This is a um, reasonably well-researched area. Um, but for the specific thread I'm interested in, um, I'll give you again a very, what I hope to be a pretty linear path to read if people want to get into the field. I think this is the sim simplest linear path where you progressively add complexity and concepts. So I think the ultimate starting point to algo trading is the paper of and Chris, not because there haven't been stochastic control problems before, but they were written by uh, economists for human traders, meaning the goal wasn't to come up with a formula that could be implemented on an algorithm. The goal was to write a toy model that gave some intuition to traders, and then the traders would make their human decision anyway. And it's really the first paper that says, take out the human altogether. Here is a formula that you can code up on a machine, and the machine can make decisions for you. And it sounds silly and obvious, and like nowadays, why would you not do that? But uh, it's it's hard to understate how innovative that uh, how novel that was in two thousand one. The idea of writing a scarce control problem not as a toy model for some human to make better decisions, but be extremely explicit about again actions and state variables and what's measurable, what's hidden, and say, okay, this is now. Based on what you can observe, this is what the algorithm can automatically decide. Um, the next paper is the Abhijan Rang model, because I think it's the simplest model for which you have a close form formula, and that's very readable and very uh, useful uh, for optimal execution. Gary and Peterson is uh, fundamental because it, it um, extends the domain of applications from just optimal execution to statistical arbitrage, but for construction and uh, risk management, ultimately. Um, I have a paper with Johannes Molkarbe from, from Imperial College and, and his student section, um, where we analyze a more sophisticated model by Kruzer and von Ursov. Um, uh, and I think that that model is very good. Um, and finally, I kind of conclude this particular thread with the most general and therefore the most technical paper by Abhijabi and uh, Abby Jabber and Neumann, where they just solved the most general decay kernel alpha signals, so all the bells and whistles you can think of uh, at that point. Um, I wouldn't recommend starting with these. Again, I, I give you a linear thread so that you can build up uh, both the, the, the practical use cases and, and the, the control theory. Um, but yeah, again, non-exhaustive. There are many other things that you should read, especially if you're interested. Uh, I have a slight uh, focus on, on certain types of problems. If you care about market making, which I also care about, but there's many other papers to read. Um, again, Ramacont, uh, Olivier Guéant, uh, uh, Alvaro, uh, Cartea, and so on and so forth. Um, yeah. Now I have two more sets of slides before I go into the meat of the talk. Um, the first set of slides is uh, reiterating that distinction between stochastic control and stochastic echoes. I apologize for people who are already well, well versed in stochastic control. Um, I think there's some sometimes some misconceptions, so I just want to be extremely clear about these things. So um, the first one is just this distinction between controls, state variables, and exogenous variables. Um, just be extremely precise about which one you use. Once you've distinguished between these three things, everything else is just Ito's formula and, and traditional methods, whether it's Lagrange multipliers, first order conditions. Uh, methods of variations, all these kinds of uh, things. Uh, but uh, the, the key mathematical difficulty really is being very careful and precise about your spaces of admissible controls, um, the space of which space the state variables can reach, and these kinds of things. What kind of input variables you can put in before your control problem becomes ill-defined, and so on and so forth. That leads me to um, some of the 
technical aspects of control theory. Um, for the example, I'll, I'll stick to something that can be solved via elementary methods, but not everything can be solved with elementary methods. So first, I'll give a reference to a book. I'm not saying this is the only book or even the best book on the topic. It's just the book that I learned back in, when I started my PhD. Uh, so, so I have a, an affinity, and uh, it's kind of, for me, the textbook on scarce control theory. Uh, but I also think there's great uh, books. Again, I'll, I'll keep quoting uh, Jaime Longal and Cartier and Olivier Guillaume's books in the sense of they probably have applications that are a little bit more modern. Uh, this book is more option theory and, and Merton problems, style problems, which are also very interesting finance problems, uh, versus the other two books I mentioned have uh, more microstructure-related problems, such as market making, optimal execution, and so on and so forth. Um, so yeah, so, so those would be the books I would recommend. And then in terms of methods, there's really a reasonably clear ordering in terms of sophistication of the methods. Uh, here, it's less of a tree and more of a, of a linear path. And by no means should you necessarily go to solution four just because it's it's the conclusion of that path. But basically, in terms of how we solve stochastic control problems once they're well defined, uh, you can do pointwise optimization. So there are just some problems that are easier than others, then you can just solve them without dynamic programming. Whenever that's the case, you should do that. It is very nice to do things via pointwise optimization. You should not overcomplicate things that don't need to be made complicated. However, the class of problems that can be solved via pointwise optimization only, also called myopic optimization, um, is reasonably small. Um, so then the next step is to do dynamic programming. Uh, so dynamic programming is when you start uh, caring about the past, the future, and how that relates to your current trading conditions. Um, and so step two is to uh, consider Markovian dynamics only. So if you have a Markovian system, then you can reduce dynamic programming to an HJBPD, a multiple jacobi bellman equation. And these typically can be solved either numerically or sometimes in closed form. And these are reasonably well understood problems. Ultimately, every system is in some infinite dimensional space Markovian. But if you want to really be able to solve it, especially numerically, that method two really only applies to reasonably low dimensional systems because of the curse of dimensionality. If you have a lot of uh, sources of path dependence or stochastic coefficients, which really tend to hide path dependence, then you can't use uh, a Markovian um, uh, solution. And that tends to lead to the Pantragon maximum principle and BSDs, which are a step above in terms of complexity. Um, and last but not least, uh, reinforcement learning. Reinforcement learning is slightly different from, from the previous two, in the sense that the previous two are very model-driven, and you solve the model. Uh, just one model is Markovian, the, next, the other model is non-Markovian. Reinforcement learning kind of circumvents that a little bit by just directly uh, through, kind of, uh, through machine learning simulating an agent that actually learns the optimal policy. And can be combined because of that with two or three, sometimes instead of directly learning the optimal policy, you learn the solution to the PDE or the solution to the BSD, or you might use the PDE or BSD structure to get a good guess as to what the uh, what the optimal policy is. Because um, we have universal approximators for the policies, but you know, um, the better, your, the closer the architecture is to the optimal solution, the, the less deep it needs to be to, to get there. So yeah, again, I'm in this talk, we're going to we happen to solve a problem that falls into bullet point one. This is not to say that you should not learn bullet points two to four, um, but also even if you do end up in bullet point four, it's always nice to have a closed form simple solution uh, for a simplified version of the problem, add bells and whistles progressively. And um, yeah, uh, I know this is a little bit pedantic and uh, might seem obvious to people, but I just want to, to showcase that gradation in, in complexity. Um, so now from a call it business perspective, why do we use stochastic control problems to implement algorithms? And this goes back to the Algorand and Chris paper, ultimately to not have a human in the loop, to automate trading decisions given inputs. You have inputs, you have outputs, there's no reason why there should be a human in the box. That doesn't mean that you should not have, that the box needs to be a black box because even though the human is not in the loop in real time, um, you do want people to be comfortable with your algorithm. In particular, 
um, this is why you want a stochastic control problem versus say a rule-based approach or something that isn't reproducible by other people. By writing a stochastic control problem, you can ch make changes to stochastic. Somebody can take my algorithm or Reda's algorithm and change something and it should still output reasonable values. Uh, if I change the alpha signal, if I change the risk aversion, if I change the model just slightly or change the input data in any way, it should still give me sensible outputs. I can reproduce decisions, I can model decisions, I can vary decisions, and all of this is still uh, consistent and um, reasonable. Um, I want to distinguish that from what was before that. Before that, we had what I would call cowboy quants, like map geniuses. Um, that had a pen and paper math formula in mind, or maybe even did some fancy math, maybe even had, I don't know, maybe even reinforcement learning. But the point is, none of that was shared with anybody. You just had to trust that it worked. There was, it's kind of like um, cowboy coding. Like nowadays, I don't think anybody in software development gets away with just deploying code without a code review. Usually you have pairs programming, right? There, there's just a certain level of reproducibility that's demanded and of transparency at the end. So SIGAS controls enable that transparency on the math side. If you're a mathematician and you want your research to be reproducible, the best way is not to come up with some weird kind of rule-based system and like if the price goes above this level of trade, if not, but to, to write it as a stochastic control problem. Okay, this was a very lengthy introduction. I kind of apologize because the goal is to do some math, but I also think it's kind of important um, to set the stage. Um, so the rest of the talk is going to be an example of this intersection between price impact and gas control. So um, I'll give a mathematical setup, I'll give a proof method, I'll talk about the proof, I'll talk about the result in terms of generality, and I'll talk about the trade of intuition. I'm going through this slide very quickly because I want to get into the concrete stuff. And I say that the next slide might not seem super concrete, but I, I do want to uh, have everything on solid footing mathematically, so I'm giving myself a filtered probability space. And I mostly care about two spaces. Um, so the first space I care about is bounded semi martingales and the second space I care about is basically uh, is functionals from bounded semi martingales to bounded semi martingales that verify a certain measurability property. This might not make sense to you, or it might, I don't know. Uh, but I mostly care about these two spaces because I need to distinguish between two types of variables. As I've mentioned earlier in the talk, I care about exogenous and endogenous variables. So whenever you see S, uh, curved S, that's going to be a process that's independent of my control because it's just a stochastic process. It's not a functional. It doesn't depend on my decisions. If you see something that's an S11, it's a functional, meaning if I change my strategy, it, this process will change. And that's all you need to remember from this slide. Everything else is just to make sure that nothing looks into the future and all that kind of stuff. Um, so with this in mind, um, so what kind of variables do I look at? So I look at my control variable, so that's going to be Q. My position is Q, or Q prime could also be my control variable. Um, if I if I trade smoothly, and that point is a balance and martingale. And then I'm going to distinguish between two types of prices. S is going to be what I call the fundamental price, and P is going to be the observed price. As the name implies, that means that the fundamental price is unobserved. Uh, so the fundamental price, you can think of it as the price I would have observed if I chose not to trade. Um, and so by choosing not to trade, it becomes the price that's um, not caused by my trading. And so it's an element of uh, curved S because it is by definition independent of my trading. In particular, when I talk about an alpha signal, I'm talking about a predictor of returns on that fundamental price. So alpha t is the conditional expectation of S capital T, capital T here is my prediction horizon, minus S little t. And here in a Bechstein game world, just to make things easier, if, if you're not, if you're in a black controls world, you, you use um, multiplicative returns or log returns instead of uh, additive returns. So alpha t is my conditional expectation. So given the information at time t, this is the return that I expect from now till some uh, terminal time capital T. And because I'm plugging in here, capital S, this is the unperturbed price, the price that's independent of my trading. Conversely, P is a functional because it is a function of my trades. It encapsulates the causal effect of my trades. Um, so P is going to be a function of T, of omega, and of Q, unlike S, which is only a function of T and omega. And then I just define price impact as a difference between the price that I did observe given my trades 
minus the price I would have observed if I had not traded. Promises will all get a little bit more concrete soon-ish. Um, so what kind of price impact models can we can we build? Um, sometimes you write them in integral form. I prefer in stochastic differential, as uh, stochastic differential equations. Again, French school. <laughs> uh, we like our SDEs and we like our BSDs and we like our FBSDs and, and so on and so forth. Um, so here's an SDE that describes an exponential moving average. So the simplest model you can think of is the um, Objet Lang model, which just says that price impact is an exponential moving average of my trades. And then the, the model that I quite like is the model by Fruit, Shrimp, and Fruisov, uh, which is the paper is very impressive. And um, it's the same model, except that the coefficients can be um, stochastic. Um, they're exogenously given, but they're stochastic. And uh, this is important because, uh, for example, in their paper, but also in the paper by Rama Combs, there's empirical studies that show that these coefficients, uh, at the very least, are time dependent, meaning clearly liquidity is higher, say, at the end of the day than in the middle of the day uh, when everybody's at lunch. Uh, so, for example, this lambda t will be different depending on time of day. But also, and this is very much the research of Mathieu Rosenbaum, uh, liquidity tends to be self-exciting, meaning um, even if on average it's higher or lower at certain times of day, there's also the notion, and this is a stochastic, you need a stochastic model to capture this, um, liquidity begets liquidity, meaning once you're in a liquid period, you're probably going to stay in a liquid period. Conversely, once it becomes illiquid, and market makers are a bit more uh, risk averse, it's going to stay liquid for a while. So again, that tends to go into self-excitement, talks processes. If you've done uh, uh, stochastic volatility models, this is kind of the liquidity equivalent of Garch models or, or similar kind of again self-exciting or path dependent models. Um, so these fall into this bucket. But both of these models are linear models. And I, I want to give examples of non-linear models because there's a lot of empirical studies that show that price impact follows what is uh, called a square root law, which really just means that if I trade twice as much or twice as fast, I'm not going to get twice as much impact. I'm going to get square root of two times as much impact. <clears throat> so uh, I'll just give two examples of non linear models. Uh, one is the model by Alfonso Cruz and Sheed, which is basically saying that uh, impact is a nonlinear function of an expansion moving average of trades. So sometimes uh, the verbiage that's used is J is the volume impact, of the of uh, of the trades, so the market kind of remembers via some kind of expansion moving average how much volume you've traded in the past say half an hour, hour, whatever it is, and then you translate that volume impact into returns via a square root function, typically. Um, another model is the one by Bouchot's original paper in two thousand four, the Popkin model. So here, when I say original Popkin model, I mean the one specifically from that paper. At this point, almost all price impact models are propagate models. It's a, it's a very large class of models, including the Objet Rang model is a linear propagate model with an exponential kernel. Uh, so in this slide, what I mean by Bouchot's original propagate model is a 2004 paper. And it looks a little different from the previous one. And I, I wrote it in discrete time for that reason. Um, if you try to write the corresponding continuous time SDE, it's actually non-trivial, and you need to do some functional central limit theorems to rigorously define what this means. But in terms of numerics, you can just implement this finite difference scheme and you get something. Um, but yeah, it's 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 very similar to the previous model, except that the nonlinearity happens um, before the uh, recurrence equation rather than after the recurrence equation. Um, so yeah, so these are four models. Uh, once you pick a price impact model, you want to set your optimization problem, your uh, objective function rather, your scan control problem. Um, so I'm not going to go into the proof of this particular self-financing equation, but if you've seen black controls, you know that the frictionless self-financing equation is QTDST, meaning a certain position appreciates or depreciates by the returns of the stock. And then if you have price impact, you pay the impact. So that second term, ITDQT. And then if you know stochastic calculus, you know that you need to be careful about quadratic variations and quadratic covariations, and you end up with a third term as well. Uh, otherwise, things uh, do not add up. And so that's that's my definition of wealth, friction as well, minus impact, minus eta term. And if I'm a risk neutral agent, um, so this is a special case of Gatlin and Pedersen, then I just pick the trading strategy that maximizes my wealth. 
if I want to do optimal execution, I might have a fuel constraint. So for example, well, I might also have a fuel constraint if I do something like market making a stead arg. For example, I might uh, restrict myself to round trip trades. I want at the end of the day to hold no position. So it would be Q capital T equals zero. Another application of this fuel constraint would be if I do option pricing. If I'm delta hedging an option, let's say call option, what I'm really doing is uh, doing optimal execution for a position that's a binary uh, random variable. If the stock price ends up above the strike, I want to hold one share of the stock. If the stock price is below the strike, I want to hold zero shares of the stock. So delta hedging is the same thing from an optimal execution perspective as doing optimal execution with a random terminal target instead of a deterministic terminal target. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so that's uh, not the most general framework, but a reasonably general framework. And um, this slide is just to, to kind of bridge the gap between academia and industry in the sense of, uh, obviously in academia, we use this self-financing equation, but most traders will be a little confused by that and will prefer this one. You just do the integration of a parts and their equivalent. So what, how do I read this self-financing equation? Basically, just by doing an integration by parts on QTDST, you can rewrite it as this. So alpha T is the conditional expectation. It's basically a solution to, an F, uh, to a BSD, the conditional expectation of ST. And all I'm saying from a trader perspective is every trade captures alpha pays impact. Completely equivalent to the previous one, but again, um, is more appealing to a trader um, minus the ETO terms. They tend to not like ETO terms. Um, so yeah, so that's the problem I want to solve. That's my mathematical setup. Um, now, how am I going to solve it? Um, I'm going to solve it via the method by Fruth, Schoenbank, Usov called the map to impact space. So um, it's a cute trick. Uh, basically, instead of doing dynamic programming, and you can also solve this problem with dynamic programming. The original paper by Obijan Lam, the original paper by Gallagher and Peterson solved it via dynamic programming. But these proofs are quite long and tedious. Um, they're a dozen pages each. Um, there happens to just be for this particular class of problems a simpler proof. So I'm giving that to you so we can focus more on the on the so it fits in this in this talk essentially. Um, so the, the idea of Fruits from Bonnerzov is this is a problem that needs dynamic programming. Therefore, this is a quote unquote hard problem. Um, but if I can rephrase the problem in terms of I only, I can solve an auxiliary problem, and that one happens to be a pointwise optimization problem. So essentially, what they prove is that this problem, the solution to this problem, aka the optimal trading strategy Q, can be derived from first, by first solving this problem, which is an auxiliary, at this point, abstract problem, and then backing out what the optimal trading strategy is via this format. Uh, in terms of trading terms, what this means is, um, instead of asking the question, what is the optimal trading strategy? You ask the question, what is the optimal impact state I would like to achieve with my trading strategy? Once I figure out what optimal impact state I want to achieve, I will figure out which trading strategy achieves that impact state I would like to have. That's how the, the problem and the intuition arises. And then, um, again, I don't know how obvious this is, uh, but um, this problem is significantly easier to solve. Why? It's basically, um, so it's a linear quadratic pointwise optimization problem. Um, so again, um, as far as stochastic control problems go, um, the only thing that could be easier than that is, uh, I guess a trivial problem, like uh, meaning you don't need to do dynamic programming. You don't need to care about the future or the past. You just read off, okay, at time capital T, what's the optimal uh, solution? Well, I, I ignore all the time little t. I just say I capital T has to be equal to zero. At time little t, what is the optimal solution? I can throw away the integrals. I can just say, okay, I have a quadratic to solve. Alpha i t minus i t squared minus i t drift of alpha. And therefore I can read off what is the optimal i little t? Uh, so this is why this auxiliary problem is simpler than the original problem for which you would need to do dynamic programming. Um, okay, so that's that's impact space and has lots of implications. I'm going to go through this slide reasonably quickly, but um, 
as I said, like there's methods one, two, three, four, and the fourth one being reinforcement learning. If you have a simpler starting point for the simpler model, then it's a lot easier to add bells and whistles and still get something tractable. You can also use it as your benchmark for your reinforcement learning agent. Maybe you don't have the close form formula for the full model, but if you have a special case for which you have a close form formula, it's always good to have a benchmark for your agent. Same for HJB, same for Pondragon. Um, it's surprisingly general, so it's not going to cover every single Python background and every single application, but I'll, I'll spend some time showcasing what the limit is of the argument, because I think it's very important to push simple arguments to, to their edge, essentially, um, so that you know when to start using more sophisticated method. And it happens to have some intuition, which is also nice. Um, so, yeah. um, so let me go through these three steps in one by one. So the proof. Um, the proof, I kind of hinted at it, you basically do a change of variable. And it works because um, the definition of impact as a function of trades is a one-to-one -one map. And this is important because this is basically the breaking point of the proof. This is not a general property of stochastic control. You cannot just swap what is the control variable and what is the state variable on every problem. Actually, that's why I was so uh, particular about defining what is a state variable and what is a control variable. This is a very special case, but it happens to be the case here. So here is one of the few cases where you can swap the state variable and the control variable, and it happens to be that it makes the problem easier. So, so the first observation here is the SD that defines the state variable as a function of the control variable is invertible. Therefore, I can optimize over Q or I can optimize over I, it's equivalent. I can always back out one from the other. Once I do that, once I have a change of variable, where I just mechanically replace every single instance of Q with an instance of I. I want to remove all the Qs and notice that then at the end I end up with the problem I only. Um, so there was a DQT term. I replaced that by DIT plus beta IT DT. There are some quadratic variation terms that depend on the quadratic variation of Q. I can replace those by the quadratic variation of I up to some multiple. So now I've successfully killed any mention of Q, my original control variable, and I have only a problem of I. Then I do some basic integration by parts, e to formula, and it happens to be that this problem is a point-wise optimization problem I. And that's basically the proof. So you see three lines, change of variable, three lines, it's, it's quite nice. But more fundamentally, um, it's very important to note that prior to doing the change of variable, the original problem is not a pointwise optimization problem in Q. You really need to do dynamic programming. You can't just pick the Q that maximizes the running cost. But for some reason, in impact space, you do. So it, it's kind of a little bit like uh, volatility and back controls. It's, it's the right unit to look for in the problem. The fact that you get a simpler problem impact means that impact is, you should be thinking in terms of impact. You should not be thinking in terms of trading speed. Um, so that. Um, and how do you then back out the, the optimal solution? Well, you have the optimal solution, as I said, from just reading off the, the running cost, and you optimize it uh, naively or point-wise, uh, myopically, I guess, yeah, yeah, is the other term. And uh, you back out the trading strategy from the optimal impact state. Uh, again, I've, I've mentioned these terms before. Let me take a quick sip. Um, I'm going to skip over this slide, but uh, in case there are questions, it does recover the original uh, paper by Obisham Rang. There, the proof was to discretize the system, solve a discrete optimization problem via dynamic programming, because dynamic programming continuous time is hard, and then take very careful limits as n goes to infinity to recover the optimal solution. Um, here, you just add a Lagrange multiplier and you recover the exact same solution in less lines. This is not to in any way take away from the original paper by Obisham Rang. I'm just um, want to make sure that I can recover results that were proven previously. Um, okay, so now why I like this method. I like this method because it's an extremely good starting point to more general methods. The reason is because it already covers a lot of applications and therefore it gives you a, a very good baseline for more sophisticated methods. Um, so for example, uh, I mentioned the fruit theorem about Ursoft generalization where these coefficients are stochastic, potentially path dependent, potentially with some self-excitement. The proof goes through the same way. The formula is a little uglier, so you get that impact state is not just one half of alpha minus one half of mu. It's a uglier formula, but it's still a close home formula. 
more importantly, it even works for um, uh, non mammals. And this is uh, notable because, to my knowledge, um, non mammals have only been solved numerically. This is, to my knowledge, the first non linear price back model that has a nice general uh, closed form map. Um, and so it happens to be that for a non linear, so for a power law uh, non linearity, one half just becomes one over one plus c, c equals one being the, the linear case. That's very, very nice. Um, in particular, it implies all kinds of intuition in terms of TCA. So um, one kind of, and I'm skipping ahead here on the trader intuition, but I think it's important to note that now. Um, in the linear model, one conclusion is if you have no drift in your alpha, if your alpha is constant, meaning if, if your alpha is a long-term alpha, then you, you can verify that you did the optimal thing by checking after the fact, was impact equal to half of the alpha? And that's for a linear model. And this just tells you that, well, if you have a square root model, just bump that one half to two thirds. If you have a square root model, your impact should be two thirds of your long-term alpha. And this is, these kinds of rule of thumbs, yes, you're, you're going to implement a much more sophisticated, potentially black box uh, strategy, but having these rules of thumbs to kind of check that your solution is sensible for easy cases is very important for building trust in these uh, systems. Uh, and for just unit testing your systems as well. Um, Another case that you might be surprised can be solved is the case with a random target. So for example, that, that um, option pricing case, it also covers market making, which is kind of nice. You get a formula. Uh, so, so the first term here is the expectation. Uh, so in expectation, you basically solve Obijal and Ram, and then there's a correction term every time your target changes. Uh, put differently, uh, initially, you just apply Obijal and Ram on your delta, on your, if, if you're at, at the money, it's one half, right? But then you just update it based on the delta, essentially based on this uh, weird kernel over there. Uh, again, I, I'm skimming through those because I only have 15 minutes left, but also if there is a particular application or a particular math method that's of more of interest, I can come back to these. I, I wanna, I didn't wanna completely skip the slides. I just wanna show that I have them so that if there are questions about specific elements, for example, somebody does research, I don't know, so this slide is on Nash Equilibrio. If somebody does research on mean field gains, th th this is a starting point to that question. So if you look at Nash Equilibrio, I only know how to solve the symmetric case, but you can solve the symmetric case, which is kind of nice. And this is a graphical representation of the uh, Pareto Equilibrium. So this one half alpha. So in the Pareto Equilibrium, you just trade until Alpha impact is half of the alpha, and you capture the other half, essentially. But if you compete with somebody, um, you're going to trade much more aggressively. Uh, you start off at 2 thirds of the alpha, and you don't have the terminal jump. Now, um, uh, why do you not have a terminal jump? Why do you have an initial terminal jump is a thing that uh, bugged me for a little bit, but now I, I have good intuition on that. If I jump at the beginning, and Rita and I have the same alpha signal, um, there's nothing we can do, which is going to jump, right, simultaneously. But if I'm going to jump at the end of the day, Rita has a very, very, very strong incentive to jump epsilon before me, epsilon before I push up the price by a lot. I know that, so I'm going to jump two epsilons before, and so on and so forth. So you end up, by that argument, end up unfolding the jump, and it becomes this exponential curve instead. Um, you do want to be... You do want to trade more into the close um, because of border effects, but you cannot. You do not want in a competitive equilibrium to do a jump trade because people anticipate your jump trade and will jump right before it. Um, yeah. Anyhow, I already went too much on attention here, unless somebody's interested in, in games. Um, so in terms of intuition, um, maybe the first point of intuition is why does alpha decay come into play? And I'll quote the original paper by Gavin and Pedersen because it's the fundamental paper here. Alpha decay is important because it determines how long the investor can enjoy high expected returns and therefore affects the trade-off between return and transaction costs. And to, to understand that quote, I really want to go back to Merton or Markowitz. If it weren't for transaction costs, I wouldn't care about alpha decay. My optimal strategy would only care about my about my signal, not about how quickly my signal decays. Um, but, and this is kind of rule number one when you start caring about trading, not just about you know long-term investing. If you care about trading, you care a lot about decay. 
and what this quote gives you is that you care about decay because of transaction cost. It's a one-to-one -one map. Another way to think about it is if I set beta to infinity, meaning my impact never decays, then um, the dependence on alpha decay disappears. I just get impact equals one half of alpha. I, I have no dependency anymore on alpha decay, and I have no dependency anymore on the impact model. That's intuition number one. And I, I give here the example of the linear model with constant coefficients, but for all the other models I've described, you can more generically say that the optimal impact state depends on your alpha, but also your alpha decay. And that's just an important and a property to capture in your model, an important property to communicate. So you should always try to convey how your trading strategy, even if it's a black box algorithm, how your trading strategy depends on your alpha decay, not just on your alpha. That's something that tends to be, if you don't come from a trading background, you tend to forget that. Um, if I give you the same alpha strength, but one of them decays quickly, one thing is silly, you should have very different profiles, trading profiles. If you don't, something's wrong. Um, the second intuition is this one half, uh, which Ezechenko um, kind of captured uh, very well. It's a consequence of the linear quadratic optimization problem. It is always optimal to give half of your long-term alpha in impact cost. Now, as I said, with in alpha decay becomes a little bit more than one half, but uh, the quote here by Zichenko is for long-term alpha only. Again, gives you a good a unit test. If you plug in an alpha that has no alpha decay, like it happens in two months from now and you're trading today, that's a long-term alpha, you should be paying half of your impact, half of your alpha impact. This is this quote by Zichenko. And so this is very a very practical unit test, also a very practical rule of thumb for transaction cost analysis. Okay, so that, that covers my particular example. Um, again, it's not the end all be all of price impact trading or, or gas control. I just wanted to illustrate a lot of the concepts on a model for which I don't need to necessarily spend time on um, HAB equations and viscosity solutions, If you, but you should learn those, or reinforcement learning and how to scale simulations to a large cluster and it, you know there's lots of technicalities that i didn't want to this talk to be about um i really want to and so this is going to be the going back to to high level slash hand wavy uh conclusions here uh, the takeaways here are really points a and b c d and e are just consequences when you do price impact and stress control you should be ex you it serves you well to be extremely clean about cause and effect from a price impact perspective and actions versus state variables versus exogenous variables from a scats control perspective. Because as you ramp up the complexity, those things stay constant. Whether you use point-wise optimization, HGAB, Puntriagin, uh, or reinforcement learning, these concepts stay the same. And so you should, uh, you, you should always strive to go from simple to complicated, and you should also always find, and this is kind of a little bit the physicist in me, uh, find uh, kind of six uh, points is the long term uh, symmetries. Um, it's been too long. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm, I'm blanking on name. Somebody will, will give me a invariance. Sorry, yes, invariance. So, in my mind, uh, cause and effect on the price and back side and actions, uh, state variables, and exogenous variables are the invariance as you. Uh, increase or decrease the sophistication of your of your uh, system here. And with that, uh, I'll stop here. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll take questions. Uh, thank you for, for your patience. Thank you for the lecture, Kevin. Uh, I think there are a few questions. Uh, Yads, you can start, and I think Hamza also has some questions. Yeah. In, in the slide 17, uh, there was a bracket, Ito bracket, in the web process, I think. Yeah. I, I just wanted to know what is the rationale behind the, the bracket, yeah. because here you have the quantity that was sold and minus the impact, but. Yeah, so there's two ways to justify it. Um, there is a very general mathematical proof and then a specific to specific model. So let me give you the more intuitive case. So in the original model, it's very well described, by the way, in the original paper. Um, so you can justify this price impact model via a flat order book. Actually, um, maybe I can draw this. Uh -huh. This might make life easier, though it will mean me breaking um, 
the thing is it. Um, so I'll stop presenting and I'll present again a different application. And you tell me if you still see it. I should ask for permission. I'm very sorry. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay. So you can justify, or rather, in the original paper by Hilbert Jonathan, the model is justified, is microfounded, one says, by a flat order book. So this would be uh, this would be the ask, this would be the bid, right? So uh, so in, in reality, it's discrete, right? It's a histogram, uh, but uh, you can you can take the continuous limit. So this would be the best ask. This would be the best bid, right? And so the the way it's justified is. When I trade, let's say, this amount of volume, uh, so I tend to use Q. When I trade DQ and uh, the height of this order book is one over lambda, then the price change here on the x axis is lambda DQ, right? Yeah. Um, so saying that you have a linear price in Black is equivalent to saying that you have a flat order book, which is why you can. Um, then have an interpretation of what it means to have a square root law, which is a linear order book. But anyway, uh, the point is you have a uh, you have a flat order book, right? Mm -hmm. Here's the key point: the price at the end of the transaction is lambda dq. Yeah. But your swap, your average execution price, is only half of that. So, so if I districtize this. Uh, so instead of doing PQ here, I do delta Q, right? The price goes, so PT plus one is going to be equal to PT plus lambda delta Q, right? Yeah. But execution price is going to be one half PT plus one minus PT. Okay. And so this one half here is what, and that ends up creating this correction term. It, okay. it, um, basically, one half delta Q delta Q, which happens to be equal to one half IQ. Okay, okay, okay. This is the micro founded. I like this proof. It's very specific to the meaning. If I choose a different micro foundation, it happens to still be true, but you kind of have to prove it by hand for every one, right? <laughs> which is a bit tedious. There happens to be a much more general proof, but it's way more technical. But if you want, I can give it to you. I, I, I like it a lot. Uh, so I, I try to find every excuse I can to give it. <laughs> uh, so I'll only give the sketch. But if if you're interested, feel free to tell me you are not interested. No, I am. I am. I'm um, oh, sorry. So then let me, let me just erase that. So so this is a proof by Ackerman and uh, Al in 2022, mm. and it's a very nice proof. Um, so the argument goes as follows. Um, what is the self-financing equation if, if your trading was smooth? Um, it would be QT, uh, QT DST minus IT DQT. No debate about that, right? Yeah. If Q is smooth. Now you say, now I don't know what to do if Q is not smooth. For example, and this is the beauty of this paper, they generalize it even to non-semi-martingales, to things like fractional barrel motion. So how do they do it? They say, okay, I want to solve this thing, right? This is ultimately what I want to solve. For smooth, uh, so soup over all Q in smooth, um, let's say uh, C2, right? Mm -hmm. For this, I can do the same proof I just gave you, the, um, the map to impact space, and show that this is equivalent to alpha t impact t minus impact t squared and so on and so forth, right? The same proof I gave you where I changed the variable and all that definitely works because uh, that SDE maps C2 to C2 and I just get that nice quadratic problem, right? Um, let, me, let me be, I guess, slightly more explicit. Um, so let's just say alpha has no drift. Well, let's, let's do it with drift. So, so it's going to be alpha t minus beta minus one mu of alpha t i t minus i t squared dt, right? 
So this is an equivalent objective function where I soup over all i and c2. Now, this objective function, because it's pointwise, is absolutely, uh, you can continuously extend it to i and not just semi martingales, but predictable processes. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. I'm always allowed to do that. I can extend. This is uh, included in this. Now, L2 maps to L2 via my SD. So uh, this then leads to soup over all Q and L2 of a new formula. And when you do the integration by parts, you get these eco terms I mentioned. Mm. Now, why is this allowed? Like, I basically, I'm basically saying the correct self financing equation is the one for which in impact space, I get the same thing. Uh, the argument is a, a well-defined, well-posed this argument. Meaning, if you picked any other Ito terms and you went through the proof map to impact space, you would not just prove that it was not myopic, you would prove the problem would be ill-defined. Does that make okay. sense? Uh, so this, what, do, what do you mean by myopic? Uh, so basically, think in general, whatever this space is. So this is a generic space. I'm going to call it um, F. Or if it's a terrible name, uh, I know, a G, right? Whatever G is, as long as it maps uh, via the impact map, I can define its impact space equivalent problem. And I can ask the question, is this well-defined? Does that make sense? Okay. Is yeah. the problem yeah. defined? So it happens to be that this problem is only well-defined if the Ito terms cancel out. OK. And now I ask the question, OK, now, Assume there were ETO terms here. Which ETO terms would make the problem impact space well defined while maintaining all these maps to be continuous, to be isomorphisms? And these are the arguments. I told you it was a more technical proof, but it's a very, in that sense, it's a much more general because then I don't need to microfound it. Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'll just ask, okay, for which, which ETO terms give me a well defined problem impact space? And that is one way to define the problem. Yeah, so we go sorry. back to the uh, initial uh, bracket with go back uh, to the original yeah. space, and then that's how you derive the two terms for that original space. So I really recommend this paper. Um, it's a great paper. Yeah. It's, it's by nature more technical because the goal is to be able to define impact on, on, uh, uh, for example, um, uh, fractional environment motion trades. Um, yeah. So so it's a it's a non-trivial um, non-trivial endeavor. Uh, but yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think and so, it's just a second question, if, uh, if I may. Yeah, and, go on. Uh, you, you talked about alpha decay and uh, the velocity of the alpha, but how how do you estimate the alpha decay when a trader uh, gives you a specific strategy uh, at the beginning? Uh, so I was an alpha researcher at Deutsche Bank, and uh, the answer is ideally you do it as part of the same process. So as you estimate the alpha, you also estimate the decay. Uh, like think of it as multimodal prediction. You predict both at the same time. Now that's much more technical. Um, another solution is if somebody gives you an alpha signal, you just estimate the drift. And, but then it becomes a little bit more of a uh, ex post analysis. I give you an alpha signal. I'm going to fit a model on top of the alpha signal. So 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 uh, so. Uh, in the original paper by Gallagher and Patterson, the way they do it they, is they say, the alpha is going to satisfy this SDE. Mm -hmm. This SDE does not actually produce the alpha signal. The alpha signal is the output of some black box. But for the purpose of estimating the drift, um, this beta has no relationship. So this is beta alpha. Uh, this is just saying, if there was no new data, what is my prediction of alpha t plus delta t? It's exponential minus beta alpha delta t okay. alpha t. It's a very simple, intuitive formula of how to update alphas in the absence of new information. So think of this as the new information you keep throwing into your into your uh, machine learning algorithm, and this as the update rule in the absence of new information from your algorithm. Now, this is just a model. Uh, it's a very simple model. It is very nice because it is simple. Is this how your alpha actually behaves? No, that's that's up to you to figure out if that's the correct model. But those are the two approaches I can give you. Either instead of just predicting alpha, you also jointly predict mu of alpha. So think of it as a, 
uh, bimodal uh, prediction. Uh, so in CARA, you can you know you can have multiple output nodes, just have two output nodes. That is the better way of doing it because then it's non-parametric. But if, if 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 it's too late, somebody has given you an alpha signal and did not give you your alpha, then a you should scold them, and b uh, just hit this. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I think Hamza has some questions. Go for it. Hi, Hamza. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this year I did the uh, Master El Karoui. Uh, so um, we had a lot of courses about uh, stochastic calculus. And the the only question I al always have is how to choose like the utility function. Um, <laughs> That's a difficult one. There's lots of papers on that. Um, the good news is, on my front, I'm, I'm a little bit lazy. I'm, I tend to be on higher frequencies where risk neutral kind of works, or at least you can, um, like, uh, you can you can get away with it if that makes sense. Um, meaning, uh, so let me let me explain that. So if I do soup of expectation, let's say I'm in, I'm in uh, yeah, let's say I do. When you have a utility function, you can at least tailor approximate it to a Markovitz problem. Not saying that's what you should be doing. But, yeah, for uh, example, if you want to incorporate market participate participants, uh, impact, price impact, yeah, for example, yeah. liquidity, uh, everything. How 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 can you come up with a utility function that gives us all information? Yeah, I, I mean, so I'd say two things. First. Um, be explicit about what you model and what you can see. So I mentioned this quite a fair bit in the book. You can write the impact that you caused, right? So here, this is the case for the simple model. But I can also add the impact of everybody else, right? Um, so uh, DQT orthogonal here is the are the trades of the rest of the market. And in this case, because it happens to be a linear model, I can really decompose it. Um, so let me call this the i tilde. I can show that i tilde is equal to i plus i orthogonal, where dit equals minus beta i t dt plus lambda dqt, and di orthogonal t equals minus beta i orthogonal t dt plus Lambda d q orthogonal t. This obviously only works for linear models. For non-linear models, I do not get this nice linear decomposition of impact caused by others, impact caused by me. Um, but if you want to incorporate the trades of the others, the answer is explicitly model their impact. Now, this is only um, this is already too simple because also they will trade based on your trades as well. So in theory, you should also model. I'm kind of cheating by calling it d q orthogonal. DQ orthogonal implies that it's an exogenous related process that you have mm. no effect on, right? Even in this case, though, it might be correlated. It's just exogenously correlated with you. You see the same alpha signals in every trade, the same thing, but um, yeah. But in theory, you should also be writing DQ orthogonal T equals a function of DQT, aka they copy your trades, plus a source term, aka they have independent reasons to trade. Um, so uh, in terms of, and this is going to create a big source of noise in your PNL that then you know your utility will care a lot about, right? Um, because if you're risk neutral, maybe some of these Brownian terms just disappear in expectation. Uh, but these are hard questions. And, and the, the general answer is, especially if you want close to is um, figure out what your main trade-off is and then kind of do a Taylor expansion of the others. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, yeah, I see. But but ideally you don't do that. Um, uh, ideally you solve the full problem. And this is what I was uh, mentioning, what I was talking about when I talked about methods one to four. Um, like the easy model is the one without the bell and whistle. Then you add the bells and whistles. Maybe the epsilon easiest model is to do just epsilon away from the known solution and do a Taylor expansion around that. But ultimately, once you start adding these bells and whistles, like taking into account that other people are trading, uh, you might not get a nice close from formula anymore. You might have to, you know, learn so that. Be, yeah. Um, or at least use a BSD to to yeah. do some things. Um, like, unfortunately, I, I hope I didn't 
give the weird impression that everything has been solved in closed form in, in, in the literature. Uh, uh, I <laughs> model a Pinckney problem, which I think I claim to be quite general, but not fully general, that can be solved in closed form. But um, uh, the bell whistle that you mentioned is definitely um, on, on, on the uh, uh, engaged brain side of things. Uh, did I answer your question or, or was this Yeah, not? yeah. Uh, if, if we want like to compare between hoax processes or quadratic hoax processes and stochastic calculus in like uh, detecting uh, events uh, in the order book, what would you say? Um, so I think hoax processes are better at describing the real data, but continuous time uh, what I call reduced form models, so it's to kind of say like each of the fusion century are a little bit easier to solve. And the question is, what is so this goes back to what stochastic form are you trying to solve? If you're trying to solve which venue am I going to trade on and where do I place my limit order books, use Hox processes. Mm. Because the model I just described is just not granular enough because really what it decides, the action, the control variable I control is my trading speed. It's just not. That's not what you're actually deciding in the case that you just gave me. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, uh, so in your case, I would solve a stochastic control problem that is driven by Hox processes, uh, and that probably has a much higher dimensional state variable, um, state variable and control variable. But conversely, if you're doing optimal execution, a la Almgren, Chris, you don't need you, your control variable is not which venue do you trade on. Your state variable is, or your control variable rather, is what speed do I trade at? And you don't need Hox processes to decide that. Um, okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you very much. No problem. Other questions? I don't have a question myself personally. OK, and I'm also happy to switch back to the slides. I, this was mostly because uh, there were a couple of technical questions that I felt like uh, me waving my hands around was not going to be as helpful. Uh, go ahead, Brenda. If, if yeah. there's no... I have no question. I don't know if someone oh, has a sorry. question. No, maybe I, I have a like a more light question compared to the previous ones. Um, because you're in a call with people who are aspiring a career in quant finance. Uh, and there is a lot of literature, uh, literature a lot of books, uh, a lot of papers. What are your key advices you would give to someone of the age of 20 who is looking for a career in quant finance in terms okay. of things to read yeah um I because to... because you have the classics you have the book of uh of matthew dixon and and all the others on on and some books on, on stochastic calculus uh but maybe stuff that you prefer which is not very mainstream yeah um so uh, I think uh, uh, it depends a little bit. I, I think uh, for this audience, you're doing fine. <laughs> like you know the math. Um, uh, so just keep reading what you're reading, if that makes sense. Uh, that would not be my worry. Not that I'm worried, but um, meaning keep reading Sagas Jagos, keep reading option pricing, keep reading hopefully some machine learning on the side, some data science. Um, microstructure is great. I again, all the books I've mentioned uh, previously, um, all these things are things that you should read. Uh, will you use them? Hopefully, um, I, I think so. Uh, but it's also hard to predict what will blow up in the next couple of years. Uh, just having a solid mathematical foundation is good. Meaning, for example, when I uh, was a student. Uh, we were not told to learn how to code. And machine learning was disregarded as not useful. Uh, you should be as sophisticated as possible on jump processes. Now, it happened to be useful for me because I care about jump processes and in, in, in Hox processes and things like that. But the point is, like, uh, uh, computing more advanced derivatives has become a niche field rather than. Uh, but, and so it's very hard for me to predict what's going to be the next kind of big thing. But I can tell you that there was no time when I was like, oh, 
I wish I hadn't learned the calculus. No, like being good at math is just good. Having a common language with people, regardless of what problem you solve, is good. Um, just learn math. But um, in terms of, I, I appreciate that that's not necessarily what you want to hear when you're preparing, especially for interviews. So let me tell you uh, a little bit of a counterpoint on that, which is, um, and people who are in a master's in finance will have heard this, some version of this, um, but I'm going to change it up a little bit. Um, so usually when you're a master's in finance, maybe also in the PhD, I don't know, you're usually told, uh, don't focus so much on technical skills, focus more on soft skills. And I'm going to kind of agree with that, but with a very, very strong counterpoint. Um, so I think of it more as a 2D matrix rather, uh, as, rather than a just uh, uh, as a just technical versus um, technical versus soft skills. Does that make sense? So, so the other dimension I like to mention is um, commercial. Yeah, I know. Commercial versus fundamental skills. People in, in, in uh, at Imperial and Columbia will, will have heard this a couple of times from me. I do think it's very important to um, to distinguish. So what is the distinction between a fundamental and a commercial skill? Um, they exist for both soft and technical skills. Fundamental skills, um, on the math side, knowing what proof by induction or proof uh, plus par is, is a fundamental skill. I've had, uh, uh, and I'm not going to go uh, call names of where or which university or where I interviewed them, but I've had candidates from math departments come to me and be like, um, not knowing what a proof by induction is. They, 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 they did it by examples. So I have an example for one, two, three, therefore it must work. But they couldn't articulate a proof by induction. And you know, some of that is just vocabulary. I get, I get it, but it's not like a, but yeah, anyhow. Um, there are also fundamental soft skills, understanding who your stakeholders are, who your, for lack of a word, clients or customers are is a fundamental skill. Being able to craft that nice thank you email at the end of the interview is a commercial soft skill. Uh, so what is a commercial technical skill? Pandas. Pandas is a commercial technical skill. If you don't know how to manipulate data in Pandas, you will not get an interview. Uh, is that the end all be all? No. <laughs> is it particularly hard? No. Um, maybe the other way to test whether something a financial skill or commercial skill is, can chat GPT do it very quickly? If the answer is yes, probably a commercial skill. Should you be able to do it? Probably. Um, but um, so now with that, hopefully that clarifies what is in which of these four buckets. Now, what do I recommend? Get your foot in the door, which means focus on, unfortunately, this row. Once you are where you are, you get promoted based on fundamental skills. But basically, there is no interview process that I can think of that tests for fundamental skills. Even the most sophisticated, presumably creative brain teasers can really be solved by chat GPT because they're really just pattern matching skills rather than testing your truth. Even if people test some obscure stochastic calculus or C++ knowledge, they're really just testing your ability to memorize and pattern match some previous thing. And we've all seen the books where they give you example questions and you just, you know that the people who ace them are the people who can memorize them. And if anything, you're, and there's even studies of that, you're at a disadvantage if you actually try to solve the problem versus just pattern matching known solutions. So please do that. Please be, behave like chat GPT in interviews. I know this is very sad, but also keep in mind, especially as a junior quant and even as a senior person, you spend 80% of the time doing pattern matching. It's not the 80% that adds value to your job. But you know you can't be at. It's usually 80 20 goal. You spend 80 percent of the time on 20 percent of the value creation, and 20 percent of the time on the 80 percent of the value creation. And you just have to know that, even as a senior person, but especially as a junior person, you just skew more initially on the commercial side, and then you get promoted, and you you know you, you get better because of your fundamentals. So don't avoid the commercial side. Don't be like I'm above it. I only do I only do you know. Uh, 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 
big thinking if it's on the soft side, like big strategizing, consultant style strategizing, or on the math side, only like the most technical, important uh, um, ideas that need bazillion supercomputers to, to implement. Um, so like, uh, don't lose your fundamental side. I see way too many people who become essentially chat GPT and do very well and never get promoted because they become very good at pattern matching and executing, but everybody knows, well, everybody knows. They, they have not shown any, have, they have not showcased their ability to, um, to uh, essentially lead, whether it's on the soft side or on the technical side. Um, so really that distinction between commercial and fundamental, kind of irrespective of technical and soft, is, is a key distinction. And again, um, get the, you get the interview by being commercial, you get the promotion by being fundamental. So ultimately you need both, but you have no where, if maybe another advice I, I give to master students is um, if you think you've aced an interview, start bleeding in some fundamental uh, thoughts, whether it's strategies, like more strategic thoughts of like, this is how I would, uh, you know, more like put on your consultant hat, a strategy consultant hat, or put on your more like PhD research hat of like talking about deep stuff. But until you have convinced until you're convinced that you have aced the interview, please do not talk about any of that. Just pretend you're ChatGPT until you 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 think you have nailed it. Uh, because your, your first objective function is to get the foot in the door. And once you have that, then it's to showcase your, your leadership skills. And leadership, uh, whether it's soft or technical, correlates with fundamental skills. And um, everyday activities uh, are very much correlated to commercial skills. And you should not neglect uh, that and you should not look down on either one of these two, but um, I think given the audience, we tend to neglect soft skills and we tend to neglect commercial skills and we particularly tend to neglect soft commercial skills, <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so um, don't just do that, obviously, but uh, you know, leverage your strengths and uh, uh, mitigate your weaknesses. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah, that's an answer to my question. Thank you. It was very helpful, and I even re received messages from people in the call here who said that it was great, <laughs> what you said. Uh, I don't know if someone has an extra question or not, a last question. No? Okay. No last question. Then uh, we will wrap up this event. Uh, thanks a lot, Kevin, for this amazing lecture. Oh, Hamza has a question. Hamza, go on. No, 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 I'm ju I just did a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. Just my no worries. No, so uh, thanks a lot, Kevin, for this amazing event. Um, I've received a lot of messages on WhatsApp from people attending this call and the live stream who said that it was very interesting. Um, yeah, thank you for everything. Thank you for your time. Uh, we wish you a great Monday because you still have your Monday for us. Some of us are going to sleep in a few. Um, so thanks a lot. Um, and uh, we'll get in touch on LinkedIn. If someone has other questions, feel free to add Kevin on LinkedIn. And I think he will be happy to help you. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.